Let's translate Acts 17 verses 30 and 31. Etis anthropis pantas pantahu metanin metanoin kathoti estisen imeran en i meli krinin tin igumenin pistin araschon pasin anastisas of ton ech necron necron which of course loosely translates to on the one hand therefore god overlooked the times of ignorance tanun tanin rather now he commands or instructs to men everyone everywhere to repent because he appointed a day in which he intends to judge the world in righteousness in a man whom he appointed faith given to all resur raising him from the dead if you want to show your support and sport some cool merch pick up this greek jesus is lord zip up hoodie from the merch store today We've got our post positive un and men and our subject is god here god overlooked times of ignorance tanin functions together god is still our subject here's our verb so he instructs to men every so everyone from everywhere to repent because god is still the subject he appointed a day or fixed a day in which he intends to judge the world in righteousness we have this phrase down here still i would argue with creening to judge he intends to judge in a man whom he appointed and then lastly we have three or two we have two nominative participle phrases so we have raskon piston so he gave or giving faith to all and raising him from dead umen so, otheos iperidon tus chronus tis agnia so so then god overlooked the times of ignorance Tanin Parangeli. Now he instructs, instructs who? Indirectly, to men, directly, everyone from everywhere. So whether we're talking about men and women, no, we're talking about everyone from everywhere. So from all places, all people, doesn't matter men or women, everyone is to repent. Why? Because he has appointed. He has put in place, he has fixed a day, this is the day of judgment, in which he intends to judge the world and to judge the world in righteousness, that is to judge justly. And he's going to do this through, in, or by a man whom he appointed, who he determined. Now, he has given faith to all. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So, in a man whom he appointed, giving faith to all, raising him from the dead. And we'll talk about these participle phrases shortly. Before we go any further, let me know in the comments below if you're finding this diagram helpful. So our vocabulary, we've got theos, God, right? In the Greco-Roman world, this term is used for the transcendent being who exercises extraordinary control in human affairs or is responsible for bestowal of unusual benefits. This is deity, God, or goddess. Notice that uh, even in Greco-Roman belief, Theos is for a transcendent being who is in control of human f affairs. Not detached, but involved. Now in Judeo-Christian literature, this is God, specifically the monotheistic God. So God, who's in control, Peridon. This is Bero Rao. It's an alpha contract class. You can see it's the word orao, to look, plus the preposition iper. In this sense, it is to look over or overlook. And in this context, to indulgently take notice, or no notice rather, to disregard. So he is disregarding their ignorance. Times of ignorance. What is ignorance? Agnia. So this is in general a lack of information about something. But specifically, it's a lack of information that may result in reprehensible conduct. 
So it's ignorance, but notice the possible result, which seems to be the case here. And you can see it's tantamount almost to sin in BDAG. It's of the times when people did not know God, which led to their reprehensible conduct. God overlooked that. And then ta nin now. Normally it's a temporal marker with focus on the moment, so now, but it can also be a temporal marker with focus not so much on the present time as the situation pertaining at a given moment. So translate it as now or as it is. But you can see with the article neuter plural, ta nin, sometimes written as one word, ta nin. It's translated as far as the present situation is concerned, which is tantamount to now. As far as the present situation is concerned. Now, contrast that with un and men. Let's start with un. Inferential denoting that what it introduces is the result of or an inference from what proceeds. So therefore, consequently, accordingly, then. But it could be a marker of continuation of a narrative. So now then. And it's frequently used with other particles. Ara noon, en un. This is what we have here. So also without de, which is what we have here. There is no de, but we're not contrasting in in the strictest sense. Or actually, I guess we are, aren't we? So if we look at men, the affirmative particle, we can form of mean, marker of correlation with other particles. Men de, en plin. Without any real concessive sense, sometimes the combination mende does not emphasize a contrast, but separates one thought from another. Marker of contrast or continuation without express correlation, and frequently in Anakalutha. Here is men un. It denotes continuation. And there's our verse right here. So in this case, it's marker of contrast or continuation without express correlation and frequently in Anakalutha. So it's continuing what, what was being said from before. And then ta nin marks the present situation. As far as the present situation is concerned, parangeli. So this is parangelo, to make an announcement about something that must be done. So this is essentially to give orders, command, instruct, direct. It's used of all kinds of persons in authority, worldly rulers, Jesus, or even the apostles. You can see Acts 17.30 down here with the present infinitive. So he is instructing to repent indirectly to men, directly to everyone from everywhere. So you have pas, pas upon, pantas. This is the masculine plural accusative. It's not all men because this is dative and then this is accusative. So indirectly, he instructs two men. Directly, the direct object is everyone, all men, and then pantahu. Pantahu uh, is similar to pas pasapan, but this one explains uh, as an adverb, it points to positions in any direction. So everywhere, all locations. So all men everywhere are to repent. We've seen this before in other videos. It's to change one's mind, feel remorse, repent, be converted. There we go, 1730. Now we have kathoti. This looks like kata plus OT, although it's interesting that BDAG does not say that it's kata plus OT. So I don't know for sure if it actually is, but you can see 1731, it's used of rationale for something because in view of the fact that. So God instructs to repent in view of the fact that he appointed a day for judgment. So the reason, the rationale for the repentance is, look, there's a day of judgment coming. Istami. So this is normally in a transitive sense to set place, bring, propose someone for an obligation to set up or put into force, establish. But here you can see to specify contractually, set, fix a time, a period of time, imeran. So Acts 17.31, there we go. And that's what we have here, imera, day. This is the period between sunrise and sunset, or a civil or legal day, a day appointed for very special purposes. This is relating to this group right here. Notice, for some reason, BDAG separates it out, especially of a day of judgment fixed by a judge. But this seems to be of the human court, whereas this one is of the day of the Lord. 
However, down here, the day of God's final judgment, it's listed. So bizarre that Acts 17, 31 is listed up here. Should be down here, I would say. Now, this day of judgment is the day, or he fixed a day in which mellow. Mellow means it's about to, but it can also mean intend, propose, or have in mind. So he intends to judge. Crino. Crino means to make a selection, select, prefer, or pass judgment upon, especially passing an unfavorable judgment. So condemn. Make a judgment based on taking various factors into account. Judge, think, consider, or look upon. It could mean to come to a conclusion after a cognitive process, age in a judicial process. This is of the human court, but can also be of a divine tribunal occupied by God or Christ. And here we see Acts 17.31. So who is he going to judge? Teen Gumeni. Gumeni. This is the earth as inhabited area. Now, this is not the heavens above or the Sheol below. It's in between the inhabited earth, the world. It can also be a reference to the Roman Empire. But in this case, it seems to actually be a figurative extension of the first one. And so for that reason, you can translate it world or humankind. So he's going to, to judge humankind in righteousness. Dikiosini. This is the quality, state, or practice of judicial responsibility with focus on fairness. That is translated justice, equitableness, fairness. It can be used of human beings as well, but it means judge justly. I'm still going to translate it in righteousness, but it has this idea of just judging. Now, in righteousness, but in, in a man whom he appointed. In this sense, and may simply be by. So it's not range. It's not before in the presence of. It's not a condition. It's not a goal. It could be a marker of close association within a limit in figurative of persons to indicate the state of being filled with or gripped by. Well, that doesn't seem to be applicable. Of the whole, which the parts are closely joined. That's not act actually what's going on here especially in Paul or Johannine usage, to designate a close personal relation in which the referent of the end term is viewed as the controlling influence. It's not under control. Marker introducing means or instrument with. Construction that begins with Homer, many examples of instrumental N in blah, blah, blah. It can serve to introduce persons or things that accompany someone to secure an objective along with. And that doesn't seem to quite be the case here. Expressing means or instrumentality in terms of location for a specific action. With the sword, marker of agency. Now we're cooking. And here's Acts 1731. So with the help of, with the help of the members of the council. So the man is the agent. So this and marks the agent who will be doing the judging. This man, on on here is different from Anthropos. It marks the, the man. Anthropos can mean man, but uh, more broadly, human. So, Anir is uh, more specific. And it is the man who is appointed. So, this is Orizo, which basically means to separate entities, so establish a boundary. You translate it as set limits to define, explain. Or, it can mean to make a determination about an entity. So, we would translate it determine, appoint, fix, or set. It's not the same word that is used about the day. That was istimi. This one is orizo. And in this case, it's used of persons to appoint, designate, or declare. God judges the world through a man whom he has appointed. Now, I take I take a uh, pause here against BDAG's use of through. I'm not going to translate N as through. But you can see it is agency. But you can see it is to appoint, designate, or declare. So, in a man whom he appointed. And then we come to our final two participial phrases. We have paraskon pistin pasin. So, that is giving, parejo, to make available, give up, offer, present, to cause, to experience something, grant, or show. Grant makes a lot of sense. Granting faith, except it's not faith. Pistis here mean uh, trust or, or faith, faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, commitment. 
uh, but it can also mean assurance, oath, or troth, and it can also mean a token offered as a guarantee of something promised, proof, or pledge. So instead of faith, we translate it proof, pledge, security. So he has furnished proof of his fitness for office to all people by raising him from the dead. So giving, I like how the BDAG puts it, furnishing proof to everyone, masculine plural dative, and raising him from the dead. Now, in the case of the first participle, I don't think it's adverbial. Instead, I think it is adjectival and it is providing, it's not adjectival either. Let's take a look at the rest of the vocabulary and then we'll circle back to our participles here. So, arejo, we've already seen. Grant, show. Pistis, we've already seen. Proof, pledge. Pas, pas, upon, to all. And then, anistimi, to raise. Here's 1731. To raise up by bringing back to life. Raised him from dead. Necros. Now, this is genitive plural, so from among the dead. Here's verse 31. So, one who is no longer physically alive dead person. This is plural, dead persons, or we would just simply say dead from among the dead. So let's take a look at these participles here to determine, are we working with something adverbial, adjectival, or something else? So right off the cuff, we're looking at Wallace's Greek grammar beyond the basics. Adjectival participles, they're dependent. These don't appear to necessarily be dependent. Maybe the first one is and the second one is not. They could be substantival. We'll need to look at that. They don't appear to be adverbial, but maybe they are. So we've got a lot to consider, but it could be independent verbal imperative. Well, it's not imperative. It could be indicative. Maybe that's the case. It could be nominative absolute. So let's start diving in because there's a lot to consider. Adjectival proper may function just like an adjective and either modify a substantive, which is attributive, or assert something about it, predicate. The attributive participle is common, the predicate participle is rare. Well, it would need to be in an adjectival position, and this doesn't appear to be in an adjectival position. So, it doesn't appear to be modifying an ear, for example. Now, it could be substantival. In this case, it's independent. And if it's substantival, it's not relating to a verb. It doesn't appear to be substantival. It doesn't appear to be verbal, though. If it were adverbial, it would need to answer when, how, or why. Why did he appoint? Well, because he gave proof to all. That doesn't make sense. So it doesn't appear to be adverbial. I think it's more independent. It's not an imperative, though. So is it indicative? The participle can stand alone in a declarative sense as the only verb in a clause or sentence. In such instances, the participle may be treated as an indicative verb. This use of the participle is quite rare. It appears to occur because of Semitic influence. Interesting that Acts is not listed in here. It's Revelation 1, Revelation 19, Romans 5, 12, 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 9, and then Revelation for the rest. Certainly no participle should be explained as an independent participle if there is any other way to explain it. Let's look at the participle absolute because this feels like a nominative absolute to me. Nominative absolute participle is in reality simply a substantival participle that fits the case description of nominativus pendens. Although it's called nominative absolute, it is not to be confused with the case category of nominative absolute. Well, it's substantival, substantival. This could be substantival just simply without article. It's not indirect discourse. Complementary completes the thought of another, another verb. I don't think that's it. Maybe it's a pexegetical. It's not paraphrastic. It's not temporal. Manner, means, cause, conditional. That's not the case. Concession, although, no. Purpose, result. And none of those make sense. Let's check attendant circumstance. The attendant circumstance participle is used to communicate an action that in some sense is coordinate with the finite verb. In this respect, it is not dependent, for it is translated like a verb, yet it is still dependent semantically. 
because it cannot exist without the main verb. Translated as a finite verb connected to the main verb by and. Participle then, in effect, piggybacks on the mood of the main verb. Usage relatively common, widely misunderstood. So we are treating this participle as a dependent verbal participle because it never stands alone. That is, an attendant circumstance will always be relative to a finite verb. It derives its mood semantically, not syntactically, from that of the main verb. So the tense of the participle is usually aorist. This is not aorist. It is aorist. So the tense of the participle is usually aorist. True. The tense of the main verb is usually aorist. Mood of the main verb is usually imperative or indicative. Yes, true. Participle will precede the main verb, both in word order and time of event. Not true. Attendant circumstance participles occur frequently in narrative literature, infrequently elsewhere. Well, this is actually true. This is acts. It's narrative. Which means, in a man whom he appointed and gave faith, gave proof to everyone. Now, that doesn't make sense. It's not indirect discourse. It doesn't appear to be complimentary. So he fixed a day, giving, providing faith, providing assurance, providing proof to everyone of that day. So it appears that Pareko here is actually linked to istimi. He appointed a day, giving faith to all. If that's the case, it's adverbial. So we're right back here. Temporal would be time. We're not dealing with time, although maybe we are. He appointed a day when he gave faith to everyone by raising him from the dead. That doesn't make sense. It's not present, not future, not perfect. It's not manner. Means answers the question, how? He appointed a day, how? By giving faith to all. That doesn't make sense either. It's got to be attendant circumstance. So if we were to apply attendant circumstance, although it doesn't meet all of the, uh, the not the rules, but the observations of, of other attendant circumstance in the New Testament, we would supply and, so he appointed a day and gave faith to all by raising, gave assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That seems to make the best sense of the matter, attendant circumstance for the first participle. The second one, I am gravitating towards adverbial as means. So translate with by, by or by means of. He gives assurance to all. How? By raising him from the dead. The fact that he raised him from the dead is in fact the assurance of his appointment. And so he is the one who will judge the world. And so to translate, so then, God overlooked the times of ignorance. Now he commands to men, everyone from everywhere, to repent. Because he appointed a day in which he intends to judge the world in righteousness, in the man whom he appointed, giving faith, giving assurance, giving proof to all by raising him from the dead. If you liked this video, hit the like button. And you can continue watching if you click here to watch the video on how to translate Acts 15 verses 28 and 29. We'll see you next time.